Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Daniel Matura, and I am the co-chair of Columbia Arts Access. And we are very excited today to have a virtual talk back with two members of the team from After Midnight, which is now streaming uh, from the Signature Theater. Uh, so I want to introduce uh, to our two members of the panel. Um, we have Philip Atmore, uh, who is starring in the production, and Mark Meadows, who is the music director. So um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the show, uh, which is amazing uh, if you're about to watch it or if you've just watched it, uh, you've seen how incredible it is and how beautiful it is and how alive with uh, music and energy uh, that uh, really just comes off the screen in an incredible way. Um, so congratulations to both uh, members of the team that we have here on, on um, doing such an incredible show. Uh, so yeah, I want to I want to dive right in and um, and you know starting with Mark because he's the music director uh, to just you know for some people who may not know uh, tell us a little bit about um, exactly what that means in his role and uh, how he brought this to to the screen um, because uh, you know as you've seen from the show it's a collection of um, quite a few songs and there's a lot of music there's uh, <clears throat> tap dance. So uh, it's, you know, it's, it's filled with a lot of different uh, types of media. So I wanted to sort of start with Mark and he could maybe um, give us like a little overview of uh, how that worked and, and his role. Sure, sure. Thanks for, thanks for your kind words. Uh, pleasure being on your screen <laughs> this day, evening, morning, whatever it is. Um, I'm, I was the music director for this amazing project after midnight, uh, directed by a very, very close friend, Jared Grimes. Um, the music is all the music of Duke Ellington um, with some amazing orchestrations and uh, texts with by Langston Hughes. Um, and there's so much dancing from tap dancing to ballet to just ev every part of the beautiful black body and what we do and what we can do with our bodies is demonstrated in this amazing musical that I'm so proud to have been a part of. Uh, my job was to teach all of the music. Um, and you can't teach unless you know. So my first job was to learn all of this music and to really immerse myself in the style um, of Duke Ellington and try to uh, try to try to get that sound in my ear so that I could really teach it to all of the the band, um, which consisted of we had a guitar player, bass player, drummer, um, trombone, trumpet, and saxophone. Um, so yeah, and then I, I had to teach all the music to the band. It was a crazy process because the band had literally, I think, three, two, two full days of rehearsal. And then that final day, we literally had never run any of these songs with any of the vocalists until film day. So we get there film day. We have like three takes to do every song. Before they start filming, you have about, you know, half hour to an hour of them getting the lighting right and getting the cameras in position so we'd run it with the vocalist frantically as as uh as fast and, and efficient as we can um and so after we ran it through we would you know th uh three two one cameras roll in action and there you go you got three chances to not only play this very very difficult music um well but also to give that energy and that life that it requires. Uh, Duke Ellington's music truly comes to life. And this cast who I had more like two or I don't even know if it was two to three weeks to rehearse with, they were cooking like this, the cast, the band, I mean, the, the, the dancers, um, like it would, they were just so on fire, not only because they're freaking amazing, but also because we had, a you know, six to eight hours, six days a week to really rehearse for for several weeks versus the band who had two i think we had two six hour days um and so we had to match that energy we had to match that accuracy uh so i'm not saying this to not give credit to the actors and the dancers and the amazing music and the amazing vocalists but really just to highlight how nearly impossible it was to do what we did with two three short rehearsals um doing this incredible incredibly difficult music uh, part of what I do also, I think, hopefully, that I tried to do is to make people feel comfortable because I truly feel that musicians, actors can't perform at their best unless we are all comfortable. And so if something didn't sound exactly as it was supposed to sound after the first rehearsal, 
a big part of my job is letting that go and trusting in the people that I called and hired that they'd come back the next day and do it right and not spend 15 minutes on one section when we only have two more hours of rehearsal to get through four songs. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it was a lot of, uh, teaching and, um, just appreciating and respecting the process and trusting in the people that were a part of the process, um, teaching the vocalists, vibing with, with Philip and vibing with, you know, the choreography from Jared and DeWitt and Jodeci and, and everybody in the cast, just like, that was that was the fun that was the magic that was unplanned that was unrehearsed that was um what really made it come to life but in terms of just teaching the music uh yeah it was it was a, an amazing experience that i i don't think i would do any differently than we did it it was great that's incredible i mean but as i said the music is so full of life and energy it's incredible how it how it comes off the screen um, so to follow up on that, uh, just with Philip, so tell me, you know, if you can even put it into words, you know, this process versus, uh, you know, doing a show like on Broadway where you have, you know, I guess a lot more chances to, uh, grow in the music, to think about it, right? I mean, weeks and weeks pass and you perform it over and over again versus, uh, what did you say? Like three shots to, to get it right. So, I mean, if you can put it into words, uh, what, what's that What's that like compared to, you know, a normal kind of theatrical uh, rehearsal process and run? Yes, no, that's a great question and a loaded question as well. But I also, uh, for me, After Midnight is a bookend experience. So I can answer your question even more specifically because I originated uh, a part in After Midnight in the Broadway production um, a few years earlier with Jared who also happens to be my cousin with Jared Grimes, our amazing director and choreographer. And, um, you know, that was a few years ago. And, you know, with a Broadway show, when you jump into rehearsals, you're there 10 to six every day. Um, and I think we were in rehearsals for about four weeks. And then you jump into the tech process, you have a little bit more time to kind of live in the role that you're about to jump into. It's still a marathon, but it but a different kind of marathon in the sense that you're in it for the long run, right? And um, in some ways as well, even though you are ready for previews, you still have until opening night, you know, extended an extended period of time in previews to grow into the role. And then of course, the journey never ends after opening night. You have many, many chances to evolve and, and, and get it right. And, and each audience, has a different experience each night as you grow into the role, right? So that's live theater. <laughs> uh, this very much was um, a different experience, a marathon in itself, uh, this particular production at Signature, but it was also a hybrid between um, theater and film. And, you know, as the brilliant Mark Meadows said, I mean, it was, um, it, it was go time from the beginning. <laughs> we all jumped in and it was round the clock rehearsals. If you weren't rehearsing in the studio, you know, you were going through it in your mind because you had in your head, we're filming tomorrow, basically. And, um, and different than uh, theater production where, you know, nobody necessarily has evidence of the work um, and you can kind of get away with making certain eras as a part of the journey of growing in the role every night. Um, not that not that you make those errors or whatever, but um, for this particular production, you know, it was it was a film. So it was go time from the beginning. And I would also say post 2020, uh, I, I can't help um, but mention that it hit home differently to do a show that was a celebration of the Harlem Renaissance and an explosion of black excellence that really did make its mark on modern, not just American history, but modern human history and the way that uh, black excellence has um, inspired many different styles as it relates to the arts and entertainment industry. And so one of the things that I really took to heart um, as we entered into rehearsals uh, my cousin, Jared, I'll refer to him as the director and choreographer, Jared, said, you know, when I was a child, I, and, I, and I watched 
performances, great black performances, it became my dream one day to bring to life um, these people on stage, these people who dedicated their lives to the art form and who opened doors for um, people like us young black artists like myself and Mark and, and the incredible cast of After Midnight. And this was an opportunity to, to do that with, with no, no holds bar. You know, it, it was an opportunity really to have full freedom to bring to life um, people who paved the way for us and people that many, many don't know actually because of the way that the world was and the way that the world still is as it's evolving in, in its own you know, personal freedom. Um, and so I felt not pressure, but responsibility to bring, not just bring, bring my A game in terms of the work, but capture um, the heart of both elegant defiance and joy in the midst of great oppression. And so for me, that is what jazz is. Uh, <laughs> it is elegant defiance in the midst of great oppression, in, but it's, it's this brilliant um, display of, um, of acrobatics in terms of improvisation and, um, and personal struggle and personal um, effect as it relates to ex self-expression in the arts. And so, um, yeah, as to, to compare Broadway to, to uh, the signature production of After Midnight, I, what was different for me was the weight of an opportunity post 2020 to demonstrate how Black Lives Matter through the arts and entertainment, not just entertainment, but the story behind the music. That's, um, that was incredibly beautifully spoken. Thank you. I mean, just okay. as far as, you know, the significance of it. Um, and I think, you know, I think you're absolutely right. Just versus uh, it was 2013, I guess it was on Broadway. So sort of a totally different world, right? And the kind of recontextualization um, is, is really fascinating. And I think also speaks to a great work of art that it comes back, you know, seven or eight years later and it has a new significance um, for this piece. I, I'm, you know, I'm curious to then just kind of go a little further, and then this question is for you both, um, you know, that you talk about this kind of form of expression, and it's done pretty much completely through the music and through movement. Um, you know, I know there's uh, some, uh, not quite dialogue, but, you know, words of Langston Hughes, but otherwise, um, you know, this is a, a, a piece of music and dance, right, as it is theater. Um, there aren't scenes per se, right? So. I'm, I'm curious if you could expand and both of you could expand on that of like that you're you're doing all of this and it's it's completely through music and body and what that means because obviously you know you have other experiences in your career with lots of text so you know if you could you know sort of illuminate that experience for us a little bit well i'll, I'll just say a little bit i know philip has a beautiful perspective too because what i'm going to say will just infer that he has his own experience and that is it is our own lived experiences and what we interpret, what you interpret, what uh, Patty in New York interprets, what, what uh, Helena in California interprets when they're watching it. That's the beauty of jazz is there's freedom. Um, jazz is, is, is a, it's a story. It's we're telling stories, but it's not classical and that it's written down and that's what it is. And that's what it's going to be every time. Um, so yes, this is a story that's told through dance and music, um, set up with beautiful text, but I think, but Jared did an amazing job of explaining what a scenario could be for every scene that develops throughout. And it's so genius that it might take watching it more than once to really see, but you, if you observe, and I'm, I'm not going to give it away, but you see a storyline, you see character development, you see, um, one of the actors has a, a confusing relationship with another actor. <clears throat> you see an actor struggling with temptations and demons and all of the things that we as artists go through. Um, but at the end, you see all of us just triumphant and uh, celebrating each other. Um, and every single piece meant something to me, uh, not only in the story that Jared 
beautifully painted on this beautiful canvas of, of videography and cinematography, but also um, what I was feeling in that moment. I felt a great sense of renaissance. I felt a great sense of opportunity. I felt a great sense of being just being blessed for the lack of a better word of being in the room with black people being able to tell our stories the way we want to tell it. And so if I was playing on the sunny side of the street at the end, uh, even though Jared has something in mind, even though Nova has something in mind, um, even though the band might be trying to get the music right, we're all celebrating this opportunity. Uh, for me, it might have been like, I'm, I'm going to be, we've gone through a whole lot of cloudy days in the past year and a half. This song for me is just me being happy and being no matter what, I'm going to live on the sunny side of the street with my sister, literally who's known me since I was a baby, Nova Y. Payton, and playing this song. For the trumpet player, it might have been, I'm going to play this solo like Cootie Williams and, and Duke Ellington's band. Whatever it was, though, I think that the goal is to create a real feeling that people can, that they know it's real, whether or not it's the text, whether or not it's living a past renaissance, whether or not it's living through this current renaissance, it's telling a story that people can relate to um, in the moment. And whatever that story is for you is, is what it is for you. And I'm curious, I also, I want to ask you, I mean, as far as, because you mentioned, you know, in some of your past experience with the music, um, if, you know, there are specifically new things that you found in certain songs this time around and kind of going through this process and as kind of compressed as the process was, if there were, you know, even just certain specific uh, things that really kind of you saw in a new light, you know, from, from music that you might have known for years and played before and, um, you know, kind of things that might have come out of that. Oh, every single time I played this music. And that was one thing I was actually fortunate enough to, I, I memorized the entire score. I made a point that if I'm going to only have three takes to make this music come to life, I'm not going to be able to truly make it come to life looking at a sheet of music. So I, I, I committed that from the beginning of the process, I was going to memorize the score. And in that, I was able to really get inside the music and see the amazing um, harmonies that Duke Ellington created, these amazing melodies um, that really tell the story, not only of what the title of the song might be, but to what Jared with the choreography um, was able to marry with this music. And so the beauty of jazz is, yes, there is a construct, there are chords, there's a form, but in that you can play a few different rhythms here and there, you can interpret something differently here and there. Um, so whenever I was playing through during rehearsals with the cast, I would experiment. I would, if I heard a tap dancer go that that could I got that da da da, I would change my chord to kind of help marry that rhythm. Um, if if uh, Jenny was singing something on the there's a beautiful um, oh, it's really like a duet almost between she and I uh, Creole love song where I'm just listening to her tell her story through nothing there's not one lyric but it might be the most telling song in the entire production and that's the the creole love song and i'm and every single time she sang it if she sang it differently i would marry what she did with with what i was doing and that was since as philip was saying we knew that we didn't have a preview week a tech week and a preview week to get this in our feet Every single time we ran the song in rehearsal, I had my eyes closed as much as I could. I was putting myself in that story as much as I could. There was there was no like every, every time you had to make it count because we knew that come film day, the world's going to see what you did that in those three to you know three takes. And so um, you had to give it at your all every single time you did it from the begin from day one. We were we were in there it's interesting because i i feel like part of what i'm hearing from both of you is that in some ways uh just having the music would actually enhanced things you know i think uh you know sometimes like uh i mean because music can carry so much more emotion sometimes than than simple dialogue so in some ways that focus of the production uh, on on the music really like kind of uh you know, gave your self-expression like the sort of particular conduit, right? And then you really had to like show it all through that. I think it, you know, it, it comes through in a beautiful way. Um, and, you know, so back to this issue of filming, um, I'm so curious, you know, 
obviously because you were in the room and then you know at some point you, you watched it right so that experience for you um you know because i know uh, there's certain obviously broadway shows that have been filmed archivally that you can watch and maybe you've done that or maybe you haven't because you don't want to watch yourself but if you if you know if you watch this um you know uh, how it how it came across you know because it was filmed and there's a certain amount of editing but it's not an obtrusive amount you know i feel like it was very carefully done there's quite a few times where it's cameras like long takes and um, but I'm, you know, I'm curious about your experience of doing that and, you know, how you might have modulated certain parts of the performance and then kind of how you feel that that, that came across. Hello, I'm back. Sorry. Uh, my theme is unprecedented times. That's my... <laughs> <laughs> so, such as Zooms and construction going on outside, but... All good, um, man. all good. Yeah, I will say um, what I appreciated about um, Jared's approach to preparing us for um, film day was, uh, I think the theme was endurance. <laughs> um, because during rehearsals, as soon as the choreography and the songs, the music, as soon as we were comfortable with the material, we would get reps in we'd run and run and run over and over and over again, just to prepare for, fil for filming day. Um, and we were prepared then by the time uh, we shot to do one, uh, do everything in one take. So we, what I appreciated was um, that we truly did it old school fashion, where you see those, those beautiful uh, movie musicals where they do it in one take. And it is done as such so, so as not to disrupt the flow of the piece in, a, a, as a whole and also for continuity, right? And so we, we ran each piece multiple times, but it, as, uh, you know, in, in, in their entirety. <laughs> and so watching, uh, of course, you never know what the camera is catching. You only have an idea of that. But um, what I do know in watching it was rewarding because I found myself saying, yeah, I worked for that. <laughs> because I knew that while there were different angles, I did that multiple times, uh, multiple runs in order to catch different angles as well. And so it was hugely rewarding to be able to see that so much work that was put into that process paid off in terms of the footage that came came about, and then you also see the brilliance of uh, Mike, our sound, our our um, lighting designer, and our sound designer, and then you see the brilliance of Mark Meadows back there, who's not just a music director, but he's an actor as well, and um, he's a presence on stage. He's a character in the show, and the the musicians are all characters in the show. They too are help helping bring to life people who lived and breathed and existed and helped to explode onto the scene, the, the Harlem Renaissance. So um, it was hugely rewarding and also, uh, you know, put me back in certain moments where I was like, man, I was, I remember how I was breathing in that moment or what I was feeling in that moment. So that's the, that's the interesting thing when you, when it's such a short process with a lot of work put in, it puts me right back in the moment as opposed to I can come up with multiple stories of, of uh, you know, different nights of a run of a Broadway show and, and have countless stories. But with this, it's, it's very unique because it's framed into a very short amount of time. And I, you know, I feel like the, you know, obviously when there's a live show, there's a great, there's an energy in the room and this production really kept that going um, in an amazing way, just watching it, you know, you feel it. And I, you know, I, I didn't write it down, but I, I felt that in quite a few times, you know, that it was very much continuous. And there was very few times where there were sort of crossfades in the editing, which I think helped a lot make it feel like as if you were sitting there, you know, because there's no crossfades if you're sitting there. So I think, you know, they did a really great job and the performers and music director did a great job in, you know, in doing those takes and keeping that consistency, which is, I mean, it's it's an incredible, incredible skill uh, to to be able to to do that. 
Um, so, you know, kudos to you for, for, for accomplishing that really in that, in that space. Um, you know, I want to ask you both kind of following on that. I mean, you know, it's so many people, you know, obviously really excited to get back to live performance. Um, but I feel like, and you know, we've had some of these other conversations, there are some real virtues that come out of the filming process and kind of what your perspective is on, you know, if you would like to do something like this again, even when there is live performance, or if there's something about it, you know, that you'll bring back to your live performance. Um, because I, you know, I feel like I've seen a lot of work in a new way when it's done like this. And as much as we want to go back, I do also enjoy this. So I'd be curious to hear um, perspectives from both of you on, on that as we transition back to live performance. I'll, I'll start. Um, I, man, I loved it. I love the process of, of doing, doing a, a, a film, which is basically what we made is we made a film. Um, it has to be right. It's gotta be well-prepared. Um, you have to communicate every single thought. Cause like we've always said, you get one shot. Um, I obviously missed the live audience. Uh, but <laughs> to be perfectly blunt, I'm I'm a recent father. I've got a 10 week old baby boy. And if this was a live show five weeks, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Like literally, I, you know, did my week of filming. And now we've got a product that people can millions, hopefully of people can see over the next few few months. Um, had it been in person, then with my current situation, I would not have been able to have been as effective as I think I was in a more filming uh manner um and also it, another thing takeaway that i hope i always uh, will remember is that we can do this without a crowd crowds help but we relied on each other every single person on that stage knows that flip that switch that you have to have when you really perform when you like perf not a run through but give it your all and we all got there whether or not it was talking to each other whether or not it was jared giving us a pep talk after a take of saying that wasn't it or whether or not that was meditation whatever it was um i i was i didn't answer the previous question but i was very i was so proud of what i saw and i know i've i've recorded myself um you know and listened back to some live performances with the greatest audience ever and there are many moments where i'm like that that wasn't my best and and I, I can say truthfully that I think that what what I saw was was my best was our best. Um, I was so proud of it, and I will. I can't wait to do it in front of an audience one day, hopefully soon. But I'm also very grateful for the opportunity to um, have have had the chance to do this do this work in a few days in a, in a week and not have to go to a show eight nights eight times a week for you know however long. So yeah. Um, no, I love that question. Um, I love the hybrid experience. I love that. I love, I, I appreciate live performance in the sense that it's exciting. You never know what's going to happen, right? You, you, you come there, you've done the work, you know what your job is, right? But then there's the, the unpredictability factor and the fact that you have a new audience to get to know to go on a journey with every night and uh, the, um, you know, the route that you can go is is endless i love being an actor in that way um what i love about this process and having a product at the end in terms of something that you filmed is that um i think it closes the gap a little bit more between the film world and the theater world yes there are different approaches as it relates to um the attack of material and and how you prepare to, um, you know, express to to do the work right for for stage and for film, but I, I'm always intrigued by the stigma of the stage actor that it's harder for a stage actor to adjust to, um, to film. I'm even more intrigued by the assumption that because someone's a great film actor that they can suddenly do a musical. And 
it's not a dig or a read or anything because I celebrate the fact that movie musicals are alive and well still and that there's even like a resurgence and all the more it's it's happening but I there is a I think sometimes there is a lack of awareness as to what it actually means to be a singer a dancer and an actor and that there 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 are some that are brilliant actors there and that's it. There are some that are brilliant actors that sing, brilliant singers that can act a little bit. There are some that are just dancers. And then there are triple threats. And um, each type of artist is important, you know, so it's not a comparison thing, but to sing, to dance and to act is, is very much a demanding, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a demanding job. And I love being a singer, a dancer and an actor but there's a lot of work that goes into that that I think sometimes is diminished um, in terms of the process of making a movie musical nowadays compared to what movie musicals were, quote unquote, back then. You know, you had people who were singing, dancing and acting and killing it because that's what it was. And what I love about having an opportunity as a singer, a dancer and an actor, both on stage and on screen, is to continue hopefully to do work that is not an indication of what it was, but is a demonstration of what it was and what it is to be a singer, a dancer, and an actor. To understand where the movement comes from, you know, to understand what tap dancing is, to understand what jazz is and what and where the movement comes from is, is just as important as where the text comes from, as where the sound comes from, the song comes from. And I, I think a lot of times uh, musicals and or After Midnight, which is kind of structured as a musical review can be diminished as, oh, there's just lots of singing, dancing and acting and there's no story. But there are people who were singers, dancers and actors who lived and breathed and gave their lives to the art form who were brilliant at it and who made a ripple effect to the degree that singing, dancing and acting is still very much part of mainstream media. And so we have to take seriously, you know, as it relates to this opportunity to, to make uh, uh, the musical more mainstream and have more opportunities to show what we do on stage on film. Uh, we, I think it's an opportunity to take seriously how to demonstrate um what was and to to also make to give evidence that it's still very much alive and well that there are true triple threats and true musicians you know like mark meadows who understands duke ellington lives and breathes it embodies it on stage nobody can do that in such a short amount of time step in and play a whole score with harold you know that's that style of music that is not easy to do and so stepping into these moments with an understanding and an appreciation for what was so that we can demonstrate how to do it still so the art forms don't just so we don't just dismiss it as something that can easily be done you know does that make sense absolutely i oh, i'm with really, you i'm with you yeah yeah <laughs> i i and i want to you know just for a last question i want to Kind of connect the dots a little bit from from that and from what you were saying earlier both of you um you said you know to, to demonstrate what it means to be a singer an actor and a dancer um and then you know how you feel about you know is that also demonstrating what it means to be a black singer actor dancer and of music um by african americans written previous you know you're saying what was previously performed by um and you know, for me, uh, what I find interesting about uh, streaming is, is the accessibility and educational aspect. So, you know, I'm curious if, you know, because you're, you're bringing this to life on film in a way that it can reach so many more people in communities that uh, can't afford to have a field trip to the Signature Theater or too far away from it or, you know, all those kinds of things. So I'm curious, um, and we kind of touched on this with the difference of this show in 2013 versus now, um, you know, does that sort of idea of education, um, does that, does that excite you as far as like, you know, what, what you're bringing, bringing forth in that way in, in identity? Cause I think, I feel like that's amplified so much from, you know, Broadway, a lot of people see Broadway, but also, also 
not that many people see it because it's in New York and you have to pay to you're going to Manhattan and you know so I'm, I'm just interested if uh, how that has kind of expanded your brains and you know in as you said in, in doing this show now um in you know 2020 and 2021 so you know how do you feel about that and, and how do you feel about that going forward of uh, you know the, the sort of uh, responsibility of, of uh, educating. Can, can I say something about that, Mark? So I had a thought as you were saying this. Uh, you know, to be to be an actor with black skin um, is to consistently be confronted with American history in the way that we tell it, and sometimes we tell it well, and then sometimes we don't. And a lot of it has to do with education. A lot of it has to do with, if we don't know the specifics of a story, then it becomes an indication of the story as opposed to the truth of the story. And I, I, ha I had this thought one time, I, so I did shuffle along on Broadway a few years ago with George C. Wolfe. And one of the things that we did that was so eye-opening to me is we went to the Guggenheim to watch a film starring Burt Williams, who was, uh, you know, a black silent movie star. This is, and this footage had been lost for a hundred years. So in 1914, there was a film starring Burt Williams. It was an entire, uh, largely black cast, uh, black male lead, black female lead, and the crew was both white and black, right? And it was a silent film and it had been lost for 100 years in 1914. And what I thought was so interesting, you know, Burt Williams was celebrated as a master of his craft. And what's fascinating to me is that that in itself is evidence that even in 1914, um, as it relates to early media, we lived and breathed and worked, worked with each other. We rubbed shoulders, blacks and whites and Asians. We, we actually had proximity. We did not have intimacy necessarily, but we had proximity. And yet the story that was constantly told because of, because of racism in America, you watch Singing in the Rain, and I love Gene Kelly. He's one of the reasons why I started singing and dancing and acting. But the entire film is Lily White. But that wasn't actually the world. It wasn't white. You know, it was, I mean, Gene Kelly had worked with the Nicholas Brothers, you know, these, these artists had rubbed shoulders with one another. And so the reason why I bring up this, this concept of being an actor confronting, constant, to me, being an actor with black skin is constantly being confronted with hum, or American history and the way that we tell it, good or bad, is because I, as, a, as, a, as an actor and a singer who tap dances as well, I find myself a lot working in period pieces. And I'm so overwhelmed by times when you know when you are working with a director or a, a creative team that understands that there is actually a place for you as a person of color in the story and that someone, or, or that someone that sees you as a token. But when you understand history and the fact actually that um, even the stars of the golden age, the white stars of the golden age actually learn how to tap dance from black artists. You will take the work in a different direction, not because you feel compelled politically, but because it's the most integrous route. And so, um, so for me, education is huge. And so that moment where we watched, where I watched Burt Williams in 1914 and knowing that in spite of the stigma and in spite of the prejudice and all the things, he was still celebrated as a master of his craft. It was the first time that I felt there's a place for me in a period piece. And actually, I can lead, though I may not be a principal in a particular show at any particular time, the fact that I have black skin is huge because Blacks, black artists have been benefactors to the American musical theater. And that's not been acknowledged to the degree that it should, but we're moved, we're taking, we're taking the right strides. But I think we have to, we have to, as it relates to black, black American history, we have to come to grips with, well, we, we have to just begin to take seriously um, the contribution of black artists to the American musical theater. We can no longer dissociate. We can't just have a, uh, a moment where we take a trip, you know, back to when times were simpler and all white, because 
though there was tension, we chose back then to tell a white story, even though those white artists borrowed from black artists. And so it doesn't mean that the world wasn't bigger, you know? And so we, we have to be educated so that we can tell and almost retell the story right to honor the black artists and not just black artists, the artists that originated in some ways, many of the aspects of the American musical theater. And it's just, it matters. Absolutely, I, I think it, uh, as you say, like to, to educate people and let them understand like that as those contributions that it is the history of how it developed organically. Um, very, very beautifully spoken. I don't know, Mark, if you want to add to that, um, just as a, as a musician, I mean, I, I you know, I, I kind of heard that from you earlier on as you spoke about um, Duke Ellington uh, in, a, in a beautiful way. Uh, but if there's anything, you know, as a musician, if, if you wanted to add to that anyway. Short, um, Philip said everything and more. So I'll just add a, a, a little bit. Um, sorry, my, my baby, and my wife just got in. So part of the crying for just a few seconds. Um, I felt that it's like my duty to be an example to many other kids out there that, like you said, probably have not had the opportunity to go to Broadway and be able to see amazing works. And, and even on top of that, if they have, chances are they didn't see somebody that looks like me. If they're African-American or if they're Asian-American, chances are they were less likely to see that. And therefore, they're less likely to be able to see themselves in that role of doing that in the future. The only reason that Philip and I are here probably doing what we're doing is because we actually, in some way, shape, or form, were inspired to do what we do. How do you get inspired? By actually seeing someone that you can relate to, generally. You know, I've, I've been inspired by white artists as well, but I can, I'm more inspired by people that had a similar upbringing to me that I can really relate to and identify with. And I think this production is a choice that was made. We, as Philip said, you know, they, they, they had a choice to tell the true story or tell it in white lens, but they told it white lens. Whereas now we're making choices. And this is a choice, I think, to tell a black story with leadership, a creative team that was predominantly black, with black artists telling the 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 true um, beauty that that encapsulated the Harlem Renaissance through our bodies, through our voices, through our fingers, um, through our lived experiences, through our ancestors that came before us, and uh, that's what I think this is. I I don't. I think that Renaissance comes out of pain, and Renaissance comes out of struggle, and the fact that we were in a way mirroring the Harlem Renaissance in this day and age after all of the turmoil and struggle that no matter what color you are, what socioeconomic group you are in, what gender you identify with, everybody experienced some pain and suffering and turmoil um, during this past year and a half or so. And I think that it was a great uh, responsibility that we took on and and um, we we just shined. We we, I'm so proud of this product, and I'm so proud that uh, I I hope this is the second Renaissance, third Renaissance, fourth Renaissance, and and many more is to come after this project. And, and just to add one more thing to that as well, I think what was what made this production so beautiful, again just on the back end of 2020 and all of the things that ensued in 2020, um, I think for each artist that devoted themselves to this project, it was hugely personal. And um, if I can kind of borrow language from like Musical Theater 101, um, we sing because words alone can no longer um, do justice what we're feeling. And then we dance because words alone and so words alone in song can no longer do justice. And so we just have to dance. And so Doing, having an opportunity to do a show that I absolutely love, that I loved doing on Broadway, but having an opportunity to do After Midnight in a family context where my cousin, um, or where a brilliant director choreographer who just happens to be my, be my cousin, invited me into this uh, leg of the journey, um, to be able to do it in a family context about a city that I live in. I live in Harlem. My son was born 10 blocks away from where I live, actually on 135th and Lenox at Harlem Hospital, which was 
the lamppost on the street. Uh, that was that was like the one set piece that we had was the lamppost. I actually it brought me to tears because it was hugely personal this time. You know, uh, we had just moved to Harlem at the beginning of 2020 before everything shut down. My son was born there, and so we lived on the same street as the stage door of the Apollo Theater. And so I would walk holding my son late at night, and uh, you know, and I would pass by the Apollo Theater, and I would imagine the level of excellence that would that would spill in and out of that door every single night and just the people nameless <laughs> faceless people now uh, that poured into those doors and poured out of those doors and so to have the opportunity to tell the story of a sound that i only know is an evolved version that is harlem um, it, it, it's interesting what took precedence for me was the story, and then I just so happened to do what I love, which is to sing and tap dance. And so you bring what you bring, you bring yourself first, and then the tools that you've been given, song, dance, you know, spoken word, they are the things that express what's already in you. And I think that's what we have to remember as artists is that excellence is super important. You have to train, you have to do all those things. You have to know where the information comes from but you have to know the story you're telling and you have to live the story you're telling in order to do it justice. So that, that, that's what I wanted to say. It was hugely personal for me to the point where it brought tears, tears of joy to my eyes. Well, thank you so much. I, I think it really, I mean, it, like I said, it, it, it comes through, it, it, it comes off the screen in, in a beautiful way uh, watching it. I mean, it, it's, it's an incredible experience. Uh, to see and so thank you so much both of you for for being here and, and for for your work um on it and also for your ability to speak so beautifully about your work uh i think that's um that's so much appreciated and you know because part of what, what we want here is for people to be able to watch this and learn more uh, about the show so congratulations again um i know it runs i think through through august um on demand and then you know maybe after that it'll it'll run again it'll be available um so uh thank you so much and i hope you're both extraordinarily proud of of the products uh because it's 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 just it's so awesome so uh it it was great to uh to talk to you both so thank you have for having us thank you so much thank you philip great hearing you and great seeing you man love you bro <laughs> love you too man <laughs> all right bye all right, take care.